There is a saying that has become very popular over the last few years that is usually attributed to the scientist and media personality Neil deGrasse Tyson that goes, everyone is entitled to their own opinion, but not their own facts. The quote, while often used by Dr. Tyson, actually originates with the American politician Daniel Patrick Moynihan, and it puts forward the idea that while we may argue over matters of conjecture, we cannot argue over matters of fact. Facts that is held are established and true and beyond reproach, and thus they are the bedrock upon which all further knowledge can be built. Or are they? Prior to the recording of this podcast, a political operative by the name of Scotty Nell Hughes went on a national news program here in the United States and said, quote, One thing that's been interesting this entire campaign season to watch is that people say that facts are facts. They're not really facts. It's kind of like looking at ratings or looking at a glass of half full water. Everybody has a way of interpreting them to be the truth or not true. There's no such thing, unfortunately, anymore as facts. End quote. As you might imagine, this statement has set off something of a tempest in the media and among those who work with facts for living. And yet, such sentiments are not isolated. In fact, the Oxford English Dictionary has declared the 2016 word of the year to be post-truth, which it defines as, quote, relating or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief, end quote. While the OED definition does not discount facts in the way that Ms. Hughes' statement does, it acknowledges that facts, once held to be supreme in the realm of rhetoric, have lost some of their power to carry an argument. For the many, this idea has prompted an intellectual crisis. How do we move forward in a world where there are no facts or in which facts don't matter? The answer might surprise you. We do so in the same way we did in the period before the scientific revolution, as it turns out that facts are another product of that period of time. Not only is there created a new method of inquiry in the century between 1600 and 1700, but there is also the development of an entire set of related epistemological constructs, things like facts, experiments, natural laws, and theories. Prior to this time, facts were not held to be all that valuable. No one cared when Shakespeare was born. In fact, no one really cared much when anyone was born. Nothing was thought of the practice that population estimates of cities and countries or the sizes of armies were only done in the most vague way possible, often given more to reflect a narrative end than an actual one. When one studies the literature, it becomes strikingly clear that prior to about 1600, the idea of the fact, at least as we understand it today, did not exist. In this episode of the Scientific Odyssey, we'll trace the development of the fact from humble beginning the cornerstone of scientific knowledge. Hello, and welcome to the Scientific Odyssey. The Scientific Odyssey is a mini-part journey into the history and philosophy of science. My name is Chad Davies, and I'm the writer, host, and producer of the podcast, where we consider the ideas, processes, and results of over 2,500 years of scientific inquiry and discovery. Series 3, Finding Our Place. Episode 22, Scientific Revolution, Matters of Fact. quarter of the 20th century, when personal computers were first making their entry into the marketplace, they had a lot of trouble moving beyond the world of electronics hobbyists and computer scientists. While they were seen as interesting evolutions from the mainframe computing paradigm, they didn't seem to have what's, what could be thought of as a great deal of utility. That was until the first good word processing and spreadsheet programs came into being. 
when the first Apple Macintosh computers and their Windows counterparts entered into the market, with their ability to pair robust information organization with laser printing, a computing revolution was kicked off. The new programs that enabled this utility were known as quote-unquote killer applications, pieces of software that would make the personal computer so useful and ubiquitous that mainframe computers and the terminal infrastructure they enabled and supported were killed off in just a few years. Today, in our modern distributed computing environment, with its cloud-based information infrastructure, there is a continuing quest to develop such killer apps that will enhance the utility of electronic devices and make them indispensable to the modern person in our postmodern society. What you may be surprised to know is that a similar process occurred during the period we've been discussing over the last two episodes, what is broadly known as the scientific revolution. However, rather than there being sort of a technologically based information revolution, there was instead an epistemological one. Prior to the voyages of Columbus and Vespucci, there was an intense scholarly debate taking place regarding the structure of the arrangement of Aristotle's sublunary spheres. As you will recall, Aristotle said that each of the four elements, earth, water, air, and fire, would seek its natural place in a series of concentric spheres, with the earth being the centermost, and each element's sphere extending outwards respectively. Now, the belief among many scholastic natural philosophers of the early Renaissance was that each sphere would either contain ten times more volume or be ten times bigger in radius than the one before it. If this were true, the question arose about how there could be any dry land poking its way above the sphere of the water. One of the answers to this was to suggest that while there were two spheres, one made of earth and a bigger one made of water, they were not concentric. Instead, it was put forward that the sphere of the earth was offset from the center of the sphere of the water, so that one small part of the terrestrial sphere was above the water. A good way to think of this might be to imagine, say, a large fishbowl full of water that had an orange floating in it. Both the orange and the water are spherical, but they don't have the same center. Instead, because the orange will float, a small part of it will be above the water and thus remain dry. Now, as a side note, it's from this model that we get the expression, quote, to set out on the high seas, quote. It was believed that when a ship sailed away from land, it was traveling further away from the center of the sphere of the earth, and thus its elevation would gain, get higher and higher as it got further and further out into the open seas. Now, this is not to say that all natural philosophers believe this, as there were those who argued for a number of other models, including one that's now known as the terra aqueous model, a term first coined in 1629, where the water is merely thought to be collected in the depressions of an irregular earthen sphere. By the 15th century, however, these scholars were in a entirely very much in a minority, as it was held on the authority of Aristotle that the two spheres picture was correct. Aristotle had put forward a reasoned model that explained his experience, and this model had been accepted by most of those who had accepted almost everything else he had put forward about the structure of the earth and the heavens, as well as the motions in both realms. So, when Columbus and then Vespucci discover the New World and its vast extent, the existence of a thing, a whole new set of land masses, immediately and nearly completely resolved the question about this two spheres model. In other words, the two sphere model had to be wrong. If you return to the image of the orange floating in a fishbowl, there's no way one could sail around the sphere of water and find any other land, much less a landmass as vast as the extent of Europe and perhaps Africa. All of the rest of the terrestrial sphere should have been submerged. Besides the importance of the act of discovering something new, the new world's existence something experienced rather than reason provided what David Wooten calls a killer fact. It kills off the two-sphere model and entrenches that more modern and correct terra aqueous picture we have today. After the publication of Vespucci's works, only the most intransigent of natural philosophers will continue to cling to Aristotle's picture of the relationship between the earth and water in the sublunary realm. Moreover, this new 
piece of information will begin the process of eroding the validity and reliability of authority and pure reasoning in arriving at true knowledge of the physical universe. When roughly 100 years later in 1611, Galileo observes the phases of Venus, he repeats this same process. By using the telescope to produce the killer fact that Venus went through a full set of phases, just as the moon did, he killed off the Ptolemaic model of the solar system as the model of the classical Alexandrian astronomer did not allow such an observation to be made. In other words, you couldn't have that particular set of phases of Venus if Ptolemy had been correct. While this did not resolve the controversy of whether or not the Earth orbited the Sun, since the phases Galileo observed were allowed by Tycho's geoheliocentric model, it marked another important case where what we now think of as a fact overruled 1500 years of authority that had been based on Aristotle's reasoning. Yet, in 1611, Galileo didn't really refer to his observation as what we would think of today as a fact. Nor did Vespucci in his text. Both men used the Latin word res, which is translated into English as thing. As Wooten notes in his book, things and facts are not the same. He writes, quote, A thing exists without words, but a fact is a statement, a term of discourse. Things are not true, but facts are. Things and facts are not the same. Nevertheless, we treat facts as if they are equivalent to things. At one moment we regard them as things, as reality itself. At the next, they are true beliefs, statements about reality. Insofar as facts are real, they are not true or false. Insofar as they are statements, they are." End quote. What happens in the middle part of the 17th century, something fundamental to the developments of science, is that a revolution in how those who study the natural world create and evaluate knowledge takes place, and at the very heart of this revolution is this very strange thing we today call the fact. So if we are to understand the scientific revolution in its fullness, not just as a development of a method of inquiry, but as a system of knowing, we have to spend time coming to grips with the new ways in which knowledge is established. <laughs> Before we get into the specifics of our modern idea of the fact and how it comes about, let's take a look at what a fact is and what it does. If you look at the period before the time we're talking about, say the 17th century, when a thinker wished to establish the reliability of a claim, there is something of a dichotomy on how to do this. One side said there were things that were thought of as being more reliable, things like truth or doctrine, proof and authority. Well, on the other were things like opinion, persuasion, and surprisingly for us in the modern world, experience. The first were thought to be more reliable, the second set less reliable. None of these things, however, were facts. From the Greek writers, there was this idea that we would call a phenomena, which is where there were events that had been experienced and documented by an observer, but these were said to be personal and malleable, based on appearances as understood by the mind, and which could be salved, as it was called, or saved, which is actually where we get that word, in appropriate cases, as in the matter of producing a, say, a non-Aristotelian model of the heavens to save the appearances of planetary motion, which didn't match up with the uniform circles the philosopher said must exist. Phenomena are very different from facts. Facts are rigid, they're stubborn, they're impersonal. They cannot be solved, and they cannot be massaged to fit one's preconceptions. At least that's the idea. Alongside this, from the Romans, came the focus on things to establish knowledge. There is a saying in Latin, res ipsa loquitur, which translates into English as the thing itself speaks. It is from this that we get the colloquialism, the facts speak for themselves, which of course, as we will show, is not entirely true. As we mentioned earlier, facts aren't things even though we treat them as they are. They are linguistic tools one uses to win a sort of rhetorical rock-paper-scissors game. 
In rock, paper, scissors, there are a well-established set of rules as to which thing beats which and why. You know, it's one of those deals where paper covers rock and rock breaks scissors and scissors cuts paper. When the game is played, however, there is uncertainty in the outcome until the players throw their hand signs. In the realm of rhetoric, though, the objects are different. They consist of reason, authority, and experience, say. Moreover, there aren't exactly clear-cut rules as to which thing beats which, at least not without facts. In the 15th century, one thing that was clear, however, is that both reason and authority did trump experience, which, as we've mentioned in previous episodes, was thought to be unreliable and subjective. The senses could lie, it was thought, whereas conclusions re reached by deductive reasonings could not be false. The invention of the fact in the 17th century changes all of this. Facts act as a trump card in the game, meaning that experience, if understood correctly, something we'll get to, has, an, has enough weight to nullify both reason and authority. You throw a fact on there, you beat everybody. The Oxford English Dictionary, from various editions in the 18th and 19th century, attests to this reality when it says, facts are stubborn things, facts are more powerful than arguments, and one fact destroys this fiction. Getting to that point, though, isn't easy. The writer Thomas Brown says in his book, Vulgar Errors, published in 1646, quote, We are often constrained to stand alone against the strength of opinion, and to meet the Goliath and giant of authority, with contemptible pebbles and feeble arguments drawn from the script and slender stock of ourselves, end quote. His comments are made in the context of trying to show the falsity of many commonly held beliefs of his time. He knows what he's trying to do. He's trying to sort of disprove things by saying, you know, look, I've seen something, we've established it based on experience. But he lacks the language for what he's attempting to bring to bear. He doesn't know what a fact is. He has the evidence to show that the belief that elephants have no knees, for example, is wrong. But he doesn't know how to bring that evidence to use in a way that will override opinion or authority. However, in the middle of the 17th century, the two ideas of phenomena from the Greek and things from the Latin will be merged together to develop the construct that something experienced can be said to be more reliable than authority and even reason. So how do we get there? How do we get from the point where there are no actual words for fact in either Greek or Latin to the point where facts become the currency in the realm of science? The invention of the fact can be traced to some of the things we discussed in our last episode. The use of mathematics to represent reality and the emphasis on correct representations of living organisms. To this can be added the new focus on making measurements with a much higher level of precision and accuracy and quantifying these things in order to compare them with the mathematical models being developed to describe systems. It is here that the work of Tycho Brahe holds a central importance as it will be what forces Kepler to reject circular orbits and move on to other possibilities, eventually leading him to ellipses. When Kepler publishes the new astronomy, it will be this data, meticulously taken and recorded, that he will use to support his findings. While he did not call either Tycho's data or his own results facts, it is clear from his writing that he saw them in that way. What is important to see here is that the data acted as evidence to support his conclusions, and it is to this we will turn in our search to understand the development of this idea that we call the fact. When one reads Kepler's writing, it is found in narrative form. He relates everything to his reader as it happened. One is taken on his train of thought from his starting point, through his trials and errors, successes and failures, until the final conclusion is reached. In this way, Kepler establishes his claim by appealing to a path of discovery from well-accepted beginning positions through a chain of unquestionable evidence pointing out dead ends and unfruitful side alleys to an unassailable endpoint. He can't appeal to authority as he and his work have little of that, and so he overtly tries to overthrow both it and the reasoning it produced by taking his reader along a chain of evidence. When Galileo writes his dialogue concerning two chief world systems 25 years after Kepler's work first goes to press, 
he eschews his colleagues' literary methods. Instead, choosing a form of writing where evidence is presented from two sides to a supposedly impartial judge. While the specific form might be different, at its heart, Galileo's work has the same goal, to convince by the presentation of evidence a, to a skeptical audience the truth of his own fundamental claims. Neither work just comes right out and presents the facts as it were. Both build a case that their evidence requires a specific set of conclusions, and then asks the reader to affirm those conclusions. Now, if this seems a lot like what one would do in a court of law, you would not be mistaken in thinking that. So, for some of you, when I spoke a bit back about the lack of a word for fact in either Greek or Latin, you may have thought, but wait, there's a word in Latin that we get our word fact from. Isn't there? Isn't there this word called factum? Some of you, if at least if you're like me when you listen to podcasts, you might have even said that to whatever device you're using to enjoy the show on right now. So this is a good time to dig into that a little bit. The word factum comes from the Latin root verb that means to do. The first person singular of this is facio, which is I do. Factum is what linguists call the neutral past participle, and it means that which has been done. What's important to recognize here is that this was a common legal term that carried over into the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, both in the continental Roman-based legal systems and in the English common law system. The role of the legal system was to, in the first place, determine what had been done, to establish the deed, as it were. In the common law system, this was done by a jury whose decision, once all the evidence was weighed, was considered infallible. Thus, to remind the listener of the two Latin terms, there was thing or res, and the deed or factum. While we're still not at the modern concept of what a fact is, it should be noted that this construct moves us away from the Greek idea of a phenomena or phenomenon in an important way. Once established by the decision of a jury, the factum is not malleable, nor is it subjective or personal. The factum lies outside of the realm of personal construct. So, how does a factum get established? This, of course, is done by the presentation and consideration of evidence. As you might imagine, evidence does not carry all the same weight or same value, and in the court systems of the time, there were very well defined amounts of veracity assigned to different types and sources of evidence. So when does factum become fact? When does the jump from a deed established by evidence presented to a panel of judges or a jury become a linguistic device used to establish the uncontested truth of a thing happen? The earliest cases seem to date back to the 1850s in the investigation of magnetism. While the specifics of those early studies are beyond the scope of this episode, by 1600, William Gilbert's publication of his book on magnetism is, is generally thought to be the first widely read work of what we might think of as experimental science. In it, he uses a number of experimental results to establish certain facts about not only the action and behavior of a magnet, but also that of the Earth itself, in that it can be considered as one giant magnet. At roughly the same time as we discussed, Galileo is accumulating his experimental evidence on falling bodies and projectile motion, and reaching conclusions that are broadly in contradiction with the terrestrial physics of Aristotle. Across the Alps, Kepler is taking Brahe's data, gathering more of his own, and putting forward ideas that do away with the Aristotelian spheres and replacing them with planetary orbits through space. While none of these authors really uses this word fact, though it can be argued that Galileo has some things that are pretty darn close, it's very clear from the context that their goal is to use evidence to establish their claims in the judgment of their readers, what we would think of as a fact today. The word itself seems to come into use in the latter quarter of the 16th century in both France and Italy. While the common narrative is that it is Francis Bacon who brings about the use of the word, David Wooten points out that Bacon never actually uses the word fact in its modern sense, and only uses factum about five times, I think, in all of his writing. 
While Bacon does clearly put forward the idea of the fact in his writing, he never calls it that. The first person who seems to do this, at least in English, is Thomas Hobbes in the middle of the 17th century. Hobbes uses the word in its modern sense throughout his writings, probably acquiring it through his friend Thomas Digby, who had both known Galileo and served as Bacon's secretary. And Digby probably got it from a man by the name of Jean Baptiste von Helmont, a physician and chemist we discussed in our series on the history of the atom. It is Hobbes that makes the distinction between the relationships between ideas, what he calls science, and the specific pieces of knowledge about the world based on testimony and evidence, something he refers to initially as prudence. However, by the time of the publication of the Leviathan in 1651, Hobbes clearly writes of both historical and natural facts, using the word consistently throughout that work. Rather interestingly, Hobbes felt that facts were an inferior sort of knowledge, not as reliable as those conclusions reached by deductive reasoning. His criticism stems from the idea that errors are possible in the establishment of facts. These errors may be due to the evaluation of the evidence supporting the supposed fact, or they might be errors in understanding the significance of the fact in some sort of broader context. Either way, that leads him to the conclusion that facts are not as reliable as reasoning, something that Hume will come back to later on. Hobbes' usage is then picked up by the physicist and mathematician Blaise Pascal. In a series of experiments, or at least in writing about a series of experiments regarding air pressure and the existence of vacuums that we'll take a look at in a supplemental episode next week. These writings will be profoundly influential for a variety of reasons. At this same time, Digby writes a clear definition of what he thinks a fact is. Quote, In matter of fact, the determination of existence and truth of a thing depends on the report which our senses make to us. This business of that nature, where they who have seen the effects and have had the experience thereof and have been careful to examine all circumstances and satisfy themselves afterwards, that there is no imposture in the things, do nothing doubt, but that it is real and true. But they who have not seen such experiences ought to refer themselves to the narration and authority of such who have seen such things." End quote. Implicit in this definition is an idea that will be more fully fleshed out by a man called Charleston in reference to a claim made by Van Helmont and then by the physicist Robert Boyle. Evidence and the natural facts they support must be reproducible by others. This idea is what moves experience from phenomenon to fact. In a court of law, the veracity of something is established more concretely by either the testimony of a greater number of witnesses or by the presentation of additional pieces of corroborating evidence, either actual physical pieces of something or documents. In the development of standards of experiment, notably that such things can be reproduced by anybody with sufficient ability and equipment, both of those criteria are met. And while the idea of the fact has moved beyond the sense of a deed done, it is clear that it brought with it the standards of evidence from legal proceedings. By the time of the founding of England's Royal Society in 1660, this requirement is so strongly ensconced that the organization takes from Horace's epistles its very motto, nullus in verba, or take no one's word. In meetings of the society, all claims to be considered had to include demonstrations that could be independently set up and observed during meetings. In the organization's statutes from 1663 can be found the following requirement, quote, in all reports of experiments to be brought into the society, the matter of fact shall be barely stated without any prefaces, apologies, and rhetorical flourishes, and entered so into the register book by order of the society. And if any fellow shall think it fit to suggest any conjecture concerning the causes of the phenomena in such experiments, the same shall be done apart, and so entered into the register book, if the society shall order the entry thereof." End quote. To summarize, no longer would the natural philosophers accept the authority of the ancient Greek or classical Roman scholars who put forward truths based on 
philosophical reasoning from various schemes, such as the macrocosmic microcosmic connection we've discussed earlier, or the idea of sympathy and antipathy, a thing that sort of really was popular right before this time. Moreover, there is now an explicit distinction between facts and hypotheses and theories. By 1662, Robert Boyle is using the term regularly in his writings, and this marks the point where we may begin to think of facts as part of the emerging scientific lexicon. One of the reasons for this ex acceptance has to do with the political situation in England at the time. Oliver Cromwell had died in 1658, bringing to a close the period of the English Civil Wars. What was needed was a way to resolve the extraordinarily divisive issues of the time without having to continue to resort to violence. In the realm of natural philosophy, the establishments of facts seems to have offered a path to do just that, one that would soon bleed over into other things, things like politics, as the Enlightenment began to take hold in the 18th century. So, after all of this, let's return to the central question. What is a fact, and why is it so important in intellectual development? To be concise, a fact is a bitter piece of knowledge held or granted to be true by all those who have considered the evidence that is claimed to support it. If the bitter piece of knowledge is shown to be false, it is not considered a false fact, but rather its facticity has been nullified. Prior to its invention, there are really two kinds of arguments. Arguments from reasoning, i.e. the use of deductive reasoning from a set of premises, things that have been accepted as true beforehand, and then argument from authority. The latter was sometimes subdivided to include a variety of different arguments, things like arguments from custom or public opinion, antiquity or judgment of the wise, etc. When, during this time, the idea of experience is a valid means by which to arrive at knowledge, especially new and heretofore unknown knowledge becomes more acceptable, Pascal argues that said since experience can act as a substitute for reason. Additionally, both Pascal and Brown, whom we quoted a bit earlier in our podcast, attack the validity of authority as being superior to reason by saying that the testimony of evidence is actually more reliable. From this, Hobbes argues that there are only really two sources of knowledge, reason and sense experience, memory and testimony being a part of that sense experience. These last are established by evidence, and thus he completely rejects all of the various types of authority previously put forward, since he claims that they're really merely forms of sensory experience from more distant past brought into the present. David Hume, writing in the 18th century, will optimize Hobbes' approach and use the same distinction by saying that there are two things that give rise to knowledge. The first is what we call relations of ideas, things we hold true because they're established through the use of deductive reasoning. These are not facts, but rather are generated by what he calls operations of thought. An example might be the Pythagorean theorem, which rests on the five axioms of Euclid's conceptualization of plane geometry. If one accepts these axioms, then the Pythagorean theorem must follow deductively, even if that determination takes a certain amount of time and effort to come to. The second he calls matters of fact. These are what are known as contingent truths, in that while they are certainly a certain way, they don't necessarily have to be that certain way. An example of this is the statement that the moon orbits the earth. While this is absolutely how things are, one might be able to imagine a case where that wouldn't happen. In these instances, the knowledge of the actual situation is based on evidence, which consists of sensory experience, testimony, and documentation. What remained was the process by which facts became accepted. An example of this process might be Galileo's assertion that there were mountains on the moon. When first published, this might have, been, might have been seen as being outrageous, as it ascribed to a celestial body something of the terrestrial sphere. It is clear, though, that Galileo states this as a fact, 
but it's what we might call an extraordinary fact. In his report, Galileo works to normalize the claim by comparing the evidence for mountains on the moon with similar evidence for earthly projections above the mean surface height of the earth by appealing to things like the shadows cast by mountains along the terminator line, which is that demarcation between the lit and unlit portion of the moon, or the earth. He provided similar lines of reasonings by comparing the moons of Jupiter to our moon and the phases of Venus to the phases of our moon. In each of these cases, he's working really hard to normalize his really extraordinary observations by bringing them back to experience everyone accepted. An important step in this process, both for Galileo and for those to come after him, was to have others replicate your results. If you're the only one seeing the moon of, moons of Jupiter, it's pretty hard for people to accept that. However, if the same phenomenon is seen and testified to by the imperial mathematician to Rudolf II and by Jesuit priests in Rome, phenomena become facts, even if they seem extraordinary at first. Over time, and with repeated observations, the extraordinarily begins to transform into something seen as normative. It is here that the importance of the printing press and the book-centered culture it produced once again makes itself felt. The presence of printed books commits evidence and the facts based on that evidence to something permanent and portable. Unlike the manuscript culture that preceded it, there was a stubbornness to these things committed to print in hundreds, if not thousands of copies that could be accessed and checked by many independent investigators. Tycho's publication of his planetary position data in 1588 and the subsequent publication of accurate diagrams of his instrument in 1602 made it possible for other astronomers who embraced his call for greater accuracy to check his results and the results of others. They allow Kepler to call upon the astronomical community around Europe in 1604 to make observations of the new star of that year to establish whether or not it was a fact that such new stars existed beyond the lunar sphere, something giving lie to the Aristotelian idea of an unchanging celestial realm. The fact that the new star was shown to display no parallax by most of those who made measurements, measurements that were published and could be checked for error, killed off one aspect of Aristotle's philosophy, thus undermining its authority. When Galileo discovered the moons of Jupiter, that too killed a piece of the Aristotelian cosmos, the idea that the Earth must be the center of all rotational motion or all circular motion in the celestial realm. What is important to understand, however, is that these facts do not in themselves establish the truth of the Copernican system, and it is here that we can return to the ideas we first brought forward in the introduction to the episode. We live in a world bequeathed to us by the scientific revolution. Something I hold did occur. It is a world where an experience has been held to be more valid and reliable in establishing truth than either reason or authority. The process in which we got to this point is a long one, but it can be said that in the 20th century, a scientific worldview with its emphasis on fact-based theories has been the predominant paradigm. For us, it seems like there never has been a time when it was otherwise. But as I hope I have shown, that's actually not the case, the fact of the matter. The fact is that the fact is a construct of the philosophy of knowledge. Now before I go any further, let me be clear that I'm not saying that the things we hold to be physically true are constructs. The moon does orbit the earth. The earth does orbit the sun. If you step off a very tall building, you will fall, speeding up all along the way until the very stop, sudden stop at the bottom that brings your existence on this earth to a rather abrupt end. No amount of postmodern rationalization will change these realities. What is important to understand, however, are two things. First, the creation of the linguistic device we call the fact, the thing that trumps all other rhetorical arguments, is something relatively recent in human thought. The elevation of experience over authority, reason, and yes, bias, is something we've decided as a culture. Facts in this way really are cultural constructs. Second, just because we have facts doesn't mean there isn't interpretation of what those facts means. When we discuss the falling of an object from the top of a building, we can assert 
a shared experience that this does happen. And we can create, as Galileo and others did, a natural law that explains what the fallen object will do. But that doesn't uniquely determine the cause of the fall. It doesn't tell us really the why. This is the realm of hypothesis formation and theory building. And while facts may constrain what hypotheses and theories are viable, they do not necessarily determine them. Yes, objects fall, but why? Galileo didn't, try, didn't know, nor did he try to give an explanation. That would have to wait until the work of Newton. Kepler showed that elliptical planetary orbits were more fully consistent with the data than any other hypothesis, but his laws of planetary motion were not established on the basis of his hypothetical magnet-like force that he claimed emanated from the Sun. Again, a fuller explanation of planetary motion would have to await Newton. When we examine the words of Ms. Hughes at the beginning of the episode, her claim that there are no facts, one must recognize that she is both wrong and right. The amount of water in a glass can be stated factually. The volume of the water can be measured either directly or through a couple of measurements of the glass that's holding the water and a recognition that a liquid fills a definite volume. This is something can, that can be easily established given the shared conventions of science. However, if we see that the water takes up roughly half of the total volume of the glass, that fact is less useful in determining whether the glass is half full or half empty. The facts constrain us to say that the glass is neither empty nor full, but it does not determine what philosophical description is correct. It will not resolve the argument between two people as to which position should be taken. More deeply important than this, however, is the idea of post-truth that the Oxford English Dictionary brings up in its Word of the Year designation. It's really not that we're in a post-truth era. It's that we're in a time when the ascendancy of the fact in determining truth is under assault. Like many, I find this a particularly pernicious trend. The world in which we live, the advances we all benefit from, has been built upon the basis of fact-constrained theories that successfully allow us to predict the behavior of systems. When we look back to a time before this sort of approach, this sort of paradigm as it were, we see broad stagnation when reason and authority were the primary ways in which the veracity of a claim was established. One only needs to look at the very checkered history of medicine to recognize that in evidence-based inquiry offers an effective and reliable path forward. In medicine, especially over the last 25 or 30 years, it seems actually to offer the best, most effective, and most reliable path forward. As I wrap up this episode, I would like to say that there is so much more that I could talk about when it comes to the scientific revolution. And both the method of inquiry and the associated structure of knowledge that it produces. However, we've been away from the narrative for quite a while and I'd like to get back to that. For those who'd like to do more study, I heartily recommend David Wooten's book, The Invention of Science, as well as the Oxford Very Short Introduction series' entry on the scientific revolution written by Lawrence Princep. Also, Nobel laureate Steven Weinberg has also written a book on the scientific revolution here recently, but I haven't actually read it, so I can't really recommend it. If there are listeners out there who have taken the time to work through Weinberg's work, I'd love to hear your thoughts. You can contact me at cldavies at mac.com or on Twitter at Chad Davies. Also, if you're interested sort of in that, that reference that I made to the checkered history of uh, medical science, I would encourage you to go out to the Freakonomics podcast. They're covering sort of the history of medicine and the idea of evidence-based medicine here in these, these latest couple, three episodes. I think you'd find that really, really interesting. Also, you're always welcome to leave a comment at our website, thescientificodyssey.typepad.com, or on our Facebook page. Just search for The Scientific Odyssey. If you want to keep up with what's going on, feel free to like us there and to join the crew. 
If you have some sort of a, a response to or a feedback for us on this particular episode, and this idea that the fact is a cultural construct, I'd really love to hear about it. It'd be interesting to have a conversation or discussion out there on the Facebook site as to what people think about this. Also, if you have a few moments, won't you consider leaving us a review on whatever service you use to listen to the show? It helps us spread the word and grow the movement. Next week, we'll take a look at the experiment that shattered physics and brought about many of the things we've discussed in these last three episodes. Until then, full sails on your journey.